bring South Bay. It's a wonderful joy for me to be back here. It's been some time. I can't remember when was the last time. Some several months ago. And so it's a great joy for me to be back here. And uh, very grateful to Pastor Ulysses and the elders for the opportunity to come and share God's word with you tonight. Um, it'll be a three-part series on the doctrine of the Trinity, and I look forward to spending the next three Wednesdays with you. It's going to be a lot of fun. So turn with me in your Bibles straight away to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. And as I said, we're going to be looking at uh, the doctrine of the Trinity of the next three weeks. It's a, it's a very deep doctrine. It's a doctrine that's uh, somewhat mysterious, and it tends to prompt a lot of questions in the heart of believers. Questions such as, must one be, uh, believe in the Trinity to be saved? Does the doctrine of the Trinity really matter? Is it, is it important? Is it necessary? Is it an essential doctrine? These are some of the questions that typically get asked about the doctrine of the Trinity. And the fact that these questions are even asked is probably testimony to the fact that the Bible doesn't specifically talk about the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is not set out for us in plain words. Truth be told, the word Trinity itself is not found anywhere in Scripture. The Bible never says that God is a triune God. The Bible never says that there are three persons in one God. And because of that, because no such clear statement can be found in the Scriptures, the temptation is to question how belief in this doctrine is essential for salvation. Well, simply said, it is. That's the short answer. It is. It's essential. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, and we're going to study it more in a topical sense than we would in an expository sense. It's slightly outside of my comfort zone. I like to take a passage of Scripture and just unpack it for you and tell you what's in it. So looking at a topic like this is, is something that I'm not completely uh, accustomed to. Coming from TMS, it gets drilled into us from the very beginning that what you do is expository preaching. But sometimes when you do topical messages, you let the Bible speak for itself, right? You let the Bible preach the Bible, and that's what we're going to do tonight. So um, before we start, I'd like to read some scripture and to pray together. And we're going to kick off tonight with this passage in Matthew chapter 3. Probably one of the quintessential passages on the Trinity, where the Trinity is absolutely on display for us. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, and I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Matthew chapter 13. I'm asking, sorry, Matthew chapter 3. My apologies. Verse 13. Then Jesus arrived from, the, from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And behold, there was a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us this evening. Thank you that as we hear these words, we can do so from the perspective of, of hearing them from the very mouth of our Father, who loved us so much 
that through Christ we have been adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High. Thank you that we can know and experience eternal life and that as we hear your words in Scripture, we do so with a massive privilege of studying it, understanding it, and sharing the truths therein with those around us. May you, by your Spirit, open our minds tonight and soften our hearts to what you have for us in your word. In Christ's precious name, we, we pray. Deep within the core of the sun, the temperature is approximately 28 million degrees Fahrenheit. The pressure in the core of the sun is somewhere around 250 billion times that of what we experience on earth. And it's here in the core of the sun that these insanely hot temperatures and these unthinkably high pressures combine to create a nuclear reaction known as nuclear fusion. In each of these nuclear reactions, four protons otherwise known as hydrogen nuclei, these protons fuse together to create one alpha particle. This alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons. And they are bound together in a particle that has the, the same uh, chemical makeup as a helium nuclei. This alpha particle is 0.7% lighter than the four original protons, because in the process of nuclear fusion, two positrons are released. And these change two of the protons into neutrons. I hope you're following me. This release, um, this release and this difference in mass is expelled as energy. And after time, through a process called convection, this energy from the core of the sun moves to the surface of the sun where it is expelled at a mass energy conversion rate of 4.26 million metric tons per second. And this produces the equivalent, listen to this, of 384.6 septillion watts of energy. Quite a mouthful. To put that in perspective, that is the equivalent of 9.192 trillion tons of TNT that explodes every second. That's the same as 1.8 billion Tsar bombs. And for those of you who don't know, the Tsar bomb was the most powerful thermonuclear bomb ever built. Now, all of that is very interesting, but you know what? You don't need to know all of that to catch a tan. Right? You, you, you don't need to understand how the sun works to believe that it exists. You don't need to know how the sun works to know that it's bright and that it's hot. And that if you sit in the sun long enough, you're going to catch a tan. In fact, if you sit in the sun long enough, you'll even burn. But the same principle for us is true today when it comes to the Trinity. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. What do I mean by that? Look at Matthew 22, verse 41 with me. Matthew 22, verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? Saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. Jesus here is quoting Psalm 110, one of David's Psalms. He's quoting him. Verse 45, therefore, if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him 
a word. Nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Friends, what Jesus did here is he confronted the Pharisees with the doctrine of the Trinity. And they had no answer. They wouldn't even question it any further. And sadly, the same is true today, not just for unbelievers and the Pharisees of this day, but even for born-again believers. When it comes to questions about the Trinity, especially when there are questions about the how of the Trinity, people don't ask. But friends, I want to suggest to you tonight that when it comes to the how of the Trinity, our finite minds cannot fathom that. I know that I am way too stupid to try and figure out how God can be three persons in one. I can't even begin to fathom it. And yet despite that, God in His sovereign wisdom has revealed Himself in His Word as a triune God. And in this revelation that we have before us, He reveals this incredible mystery far beyond the comprehension of all the creatures on the earth that His simple divine essence consists in three persons. And not in a way where each of these three persons would possess one part of the divine whole or the divine essence, so that by combining them, they would make up the full Godhead. No. Some have tried for years. There have been so many uh, different ways that people have tried to explain the Godhead. Some have tried to describe it as a, as a three-leaf clover, where each of the three leaves forms part of the whole. Some have tried to explain it like a tree that has roots and it has a trunk and it has branches. No, friends. God is a singular being. He's far from being a combination of parts. God consists not of three persons. God consists in three persons. The full being of God is in the Father. The same full being of God is in the Son, and so too in the Holy Spirit. The Father is God. The Son is God, no less than the Father. And the Holy Spirit is God of the same eternity, the same majesty, the same glory as the Father and the Son. Amongst the divine persons of the Godhead, there is not a first or a last. There is not a greater or a lesser. There is simply one divine being. The triune God. And it's a mouthful. I understand that. This doctrine is a mouthful, this doctrine of the Trinity. How are we to understand it? Recently at TMS, uh, a guy called Andy Naselli, maybe some of you have heard of him, he came to teach at the school and um, he gave a, a wonderful analogy in this regard. Um, he was speaking about Christology, but the analogy is equally applicable to the doctrine of the Trinity. And essentially says that trying to explain the complexity of the Trinity uh, as three persons in one is like having in your hand ten pieces of a 5,000-piece puzzle for which you do not have the box with a picture on it. And those ten pieces are what we have in the Bible. And with those ten pieces, you try and explain what the picture is. It's impossible, right? It's very difficult. It's impossible. The truth is we will never be able to fathom the fullness of the complexity of who God is as He exists as three persons in one. But that's okay. It goes back to our analogy of the sun, where we said you don't need to know how the sun works to catch a tan. Friends, you don't need to fully understand the complexity of the Trinity 
to worship God. You don't need to understand the full complexity of the Trinity to pray to the Trinity. You don't need to understand the complexity of how the Trinity exists as three persons in one to enter into the eternal life of the Trinity. But it's important that you believe it. It's important that you believe it. Friends, the Trinity matters. And I want to show you three reasons why it matters. The first of these is the Trinity matters because God tells us about the Trinity in Scripture. Friends, if God is speaking about it, you better know that it's important, right? Secondly, the Trinity matters because God tells us about Himself through the Trinity. We get to know more about our saving God as we study the Trinity. We get to know more about who He is and what He says about Himself. And then the third reason that the Trinity matters is because God works to save us through the Trinity. The salvific work of God is accomplished through the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All playing a specific role, but working together for our salvation. Three very important reasons why knowing and believing the Trinity matters. And we're going to look at the first one tonight. Um, the next two we'll look at over the next two weeks, but we're going to look at number one tonight. The Trinity matters because God tells us about it in Scripture. Turn with me to Psalm 19 in your Bible. Psalm 19. I'm going to read from verse 1. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and the expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. Stop there. Friends, according to this passage, God's existence and His power can clearly be seen through observing the universe. There's order, the intricacy of it, the wonder of creation speaks to the existence of a powerful and glorious creator, right? In the New Testament, Paul says in Romans 1 verse 20, he attests to exactly the same thing when he says, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and his divine nature, have been seen, clearly seen, being understood through what has been Made. Both of these passages speak about a biblical principle known as general revelation. Both of these passages teach us that God's eternal power and His divine nature is clearly seen and understood from what has been made. So when you look at creation, there is no excuse for you to deny that God exists. I mean, who looks at the beauty of the night sky or the magnificence of snow-capped mountains? I love this time of the year when you drive. When I drive down from, from Santa Clarita and you see to the, to the left, I don't know what those mountains are called, but they've often got snow on it. It's beautiful. Who looks at that? Who looks at the majesty of the giant sequoia trees? And doubts God's existence and His power. As I've said before, you look at that, there's, there's intricacy, there's order, there's beauty. There's just absolute evidence of a glorious and powerful Creator. How about the miracle of birth? In just a, two or three weeks, my, 
My first granddaughter turns one. And it, fe it feels like yesterday that I, I held this tiny little girl in my hands and I looked down at it and I distinctly remember, I still said to my wife, I looked at this beautiful little thing with this little nose and these tiny ears and I said to her, who in their right mind can deny that there is a God? And I look at this little baby. There is no doubt. But friends, one thing that we cannot see from nature is the great mystery of the Trinity. The Trinity cannot be proved from nature. As I said, for centuries men have tried to, to prove it from pointing to the unity of the tree with its root and its trunk and its branches. Some have even tried to compare the Trinity to water and ice and steam. And, but the truth is that none of these examples prove anything about the Trinity. With a tree, we see it has parts that together form the whole. And with water, steam, and, and, and ice, we have different forms of the same thing. But God, the being of God, the, the triune three-in-one God, has neither parts nor forms. Friends, the Trinity cannot be proven from nature. Prior to the fall of man, Adam and Eve were actually the only humans ever to understand the mystery of the triune God. But in the fall, sadly, all true knowledge of God was lost. And only by special revelation given to us in the word of God can man begin to know what God is. What do I mean by special revelation? Well, special revelation is how God has chosen to reveal himself in a miraculous way. These include uh, physical appearances of God. These include visions and dreams. It includes the written word of God. And of course, ultimately, and most importantly, God revealed himself in Jesus Christ. That is special revelation. The Bible records God appearing in physical form many, many times. Genesis 3 verse 8. Genesis 18, 1, Exodus 3, verses 1 through to 4, and chapter 34, 5 to 7. There are many, many examples in Scripture of God appearing in physical form. And we know that there are many examples of God appearing to people or speaking to them in dreams. You know of the dreams in Daniel and Kings. And of course, visions. Genesis 15, 1, Daniel 7, 2 Corinthians 12. But primarily, friends, God reveals himself in his word, in the scriptures. God miraculously guided human authors to correctly record his message to all of mankind while still using their own style and their own personalities. Hebrew 4.12 tells us that the word of God is living and active. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 tells us that the Word of God is inspired, it is profitable, it is sufficient. God determined to have the truth regarding Himself recorded in written form because He knew of the inaccuracy and the unreliability of oral tradition. What do I mean by oral tradition? That is man passing down to man his word from mouth to mouth. Now, you've all played that game somewhere in your life called broken telephone. I don't know what you call it here. We call it broken telephone in South Africa where you start with one guy. He has a message. He gives it to the next guy who gives it to the next who gives it to the next. And by the time you get to the end of the line, what comes out of that guy's mouth and what started off are not the same things. You've all played it? Yeah? And God knows that. He also understands that the interpretation of dreams and visions can easily be misinterpreted. 
And so he decided to reveal everything that humanity needs to know, absolutely everything that we need to know about who he is, what he expects from us, and what he's done for us, he organized it in this document, the Scriptures. Friends, if it's in the Bible, God deems it necessary for you to know. It's important and it matters, right? So let's look at some of these Scriptures. We have to pay attention because God tells us about himself and about the Trinity in the Scriptures. And there are many, many, many. I looked up Trinity, and I, I, I'm going to do a plug here for just a minute. I'm going to break away from my message. And I want to suggest that you all buy this book. Have you seen this? Who of you have this? It's called Nave's Complete Word Study Topical Bible. This is a great resource. It's a resource to do word studies. You look up a topic, and it will give you every verse in the Bible related to that. It's a great tool. And I looked up the Trinity in this book, and there are 60 references in Scripture to the Trinity, where God speaks of himself as the Trinity. And this alone, that alone, 60 references, should tell you that this is an important doctrine. Now, as I've said before, the word Trinity itself does not appear in the Scriptures, but that does not mean that the notion or the idea of the Trinity is unbiblical. It remains very important for us as believers. Tertullian, uh, who lived from around AD 160 to around AD 230, he was the first guy ever to use the word Trinity. And it, and it was not coined in any way to replace or to add something to the Bible, but it was, it was used to describe the truths found in it. It was the early Christians relied so heavily on Scripture and they trusted Scripture so heavily that in many ways they formed new words and almost like a new language to express what the Bible says and what it teaches. They constructed many new words that we don't find in Scripture to accurately describe the mysteries of God. It came as a result of the way that they wrestled with the Scripture. They studied it, and they came to conclusions theologically. They wrestled with the way that God reveals Himself, and they did so again and again and again in Scripture. Hebrews 1 verse 1 says that God, having spoken long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions, and in many ways, in these last days, spoke to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things. Friends, these many ways and these many portions in Scripture are there for us. They're there for us to get to know and to trust our God, the one true God who is singular in essence. And we're going to look at some of these scriptures. We're going to look first at the Old Testament, and we're going to look at the New Testament and see what is God saying to us about the Trinity. Now, the unity that God is, the, the, the unity that God exists as, contrasts with the, Asia, the ancient pagan societies, the polytheistic nations who worshipped and served many gods. I mean, these guys had gods for everything. They had fertility gods and gods of rain and gods of harvest and goodness knows what else. In a, in a single Assyrian city, you would have multiple temples, each to a different god. You'd have the temple of Asher and the, another temple to Ishtar. But in Israel, it was different. In Israel, it was different. They, their confession which is known as the Shema, which calls their people to hear. This confession is one of the earliest foundational statements about who God is in Scripture. And we find that in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 
to 5. It says this, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And from this passage we learn that there is only one God and that God is one. Incredible statement. And friends, this is something that the Scriptures never, ever deviates from. God is one. And yet, as we read the Scriptures, we find much plurality in reference to God. When you turn to Genesis 1, verse 1, everyone knows that famous Scripture. You'll notice the first word there, Elohim, is the Hebrew word for God. Elohim is a plural. And we see this in reference to God's first act in Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, in the beginning, God, that's Elohim, that's plural, created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering above the surface of the waters. This text is echoed for us in John 1, verse 1 to 3, that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Both of these scriptures remind us that God spoke the world into existence. And it's important to notice what John says about the logos, about the word. We notice in this text that God's speech is present and active in the context of every phase of creation. In creation, we also see God's spirit acting before the word goes forth. Before God speaks, the spirit is hovering over the surface of the deep. And so what we see in creation, we see God, we see the Word, and we see the Spirit all engaged in the act of creation. It's an incredible thing. These are the first hints to us of the plural, plurality of God. And it, it, it further leads us to consider even how He announces humanity's creation. Genesis 1.26 Listen to this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Verse 27 then, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And here we see the first connection in Scripture between God's plurality and humanities. And that's extended through to the wonderful mystery in marriage where man and woman become one flesh. Yahweh spoke again later in Genesis 3, 22, after Adam and Eve had sinned and he said this, listen, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Once again, the plurality of God is shown in this text. The plurality of God is also shown to us through the prophets. Watch this. In Isaiah 6, 8, we have the, the famous commissioning of the prophet Isaiah. And this is where God says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Friends, in Genesis 1, 1, the Hebrew plural noun is Elohim. It literally means gods. But this plural noun is translated as God. And it does so in our Bible over 2,000 times. In Genesis 1.26 and 3.22, as well as here in Isaiah, the plural pronoun 
for us is used. Elohim and us, these are plural forms. And they definitely refer in the Hebrew language to more than two. And this points very definitely for us to the aspect of plurality in God. It allows for the doctrine of the Trinity. But there's so much more. Turn with me to Isaiah, or Isaiah, I don't know, you guys say Isaiah. 48 verse 16. Isaiah 48 verse 16. Draw near to me, hear this. From the first I have not spoken in secret, from the time it took place, I was there. So now Lord Yahweh has sent me and his spirit. This is not the prophet Isaiah speaking here. This is the Messiah speaking, the servant of Yahweh, whom the Lord Yahweh and the Holy Spirit will send for the final regathering of Israel, for the establishment of his kingdom. And once again, as we look at this text, we see all three members of the Godhead right there. Friends, when God told those Old Testament scriptures, writers, what to say. Why did he so often use plural nouns? Why did he do that? If the answer is not right in front of us. He did so simply because he exists as the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's very simple. When we come to the New Testament, one of the key scriptures, we referred to it earlier, in which God displays His triune nature, is the one we started off with. Turn with me there quickly as we look at it again. Matthew chapter 3, and we'll jump to verse 16. And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon Him. And behold... There was a voice out of the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is one of the most incredible scriptures in the whole of the Bible. God the Son, Jesus Christ, coming up out of the water. God the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. And then God the Father speaking out of heaven. What a magnificent scene. Can you imagine being there in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Here in these four verses, Paul lays out for the Galatians the full gospel message of the salvific work of the Trinity. And we'll look at this passage in more detail over the next two weeks, but Suffice it to say that right here in this one verse, we see the saving work of the Trinity on full display. God the Father sent forth God the Son. He sent Him to fulfill His plan to redeem sinners. Those who are bound in their sin, who are bound in their sin because of the perfect law that they are not able to attain to. The law that is holy, the law that's righteous, the law that's perfect. No human being can meet the standards of that law. He sent his God the Son to redeem us. And we know that that took place on the cross. He sacrificed the Son of God, on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and to take away from us also the record of our sin. 
So that as we stand before God one day, we stand there with a clear record. We stand there as if we've never sinned. And he did that so that we may be adopted as sons and daughters of the Most High. Sons and daughters of God the Father. Regeneration from death to life took place in our hearts by the work of the Spirit that regenerated our hearts. Gave us a new life. Gave us a new heart. And the Holy Spirit then dwells within us. And because of that, and only because of that, we are able to say, Abba, Father. It's wonderful, right? So do I have to believe in the Trinity to be saved? Yes. Do I have to understand every aspect of the Trinity to be saved? No. But there's a key aspect of the Trinity that is vital for our salvation. And that is the deity of Christ. If Jesus is not God, then he cannot be perfect. If Jesus is not God, then he could not be the ultimate sacrifice and the penalty for our sins. If Jesus was not holy, he cannot be our Savior. He cannot be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1.29. And this is why the early church fathers, the early church leaders fought so hard for the doctrine of the Trinity. What was at stake? Why did they fight? They fought for the identity of Jesus Christ. Who's not only the Savior, but He is the self-revelation of God Himself. Amen? The deity of Christ is the bedrock of our salvation. It's upon that that everything rests. Salvation is not just God's rescue plan, but it's God drawing us from death unto life and back into fellowship with Him. Salvation is about us knowing God and being in a relationship with Him. And we can only have that relationship and that fellowship because of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, we can only do that because Jesus was in perfect fellowship with the Father. Right? Does that make sense? He has eternally experienced fellowship and love as part of the triune God. Turn with me in your Bibles to John 17. This passage is known as the high priestly prayer. And in it, Jesus prays to the Father for his disciples. But in this prayer, we are given some insight into this eternal fellowship that the Son has with the Father. Listen to verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word that they may all be one, listen to this, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, us, again plural, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you've given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. What an amazing prayer. This truly is the Lord's Prayer. It shows us the face-to-face -face communion, communion that Jesus had with the Father. It highlights for us the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. 
And in this prayer, Jesus alludes to the love that he shares with the Father. Listen to this, verse 25. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, I, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Friends, the doctrine of the Trinity matters. The doctrine of the Trinity is essential. It's essential because God reveals it to us in Scripture. And through, by revealing it to us in Scripture, He enables us to believe that Jesus is God. And in that way, we can become His people. And to be God's people means that we are people saved by God through His Son. Sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. Doctrine of the Trinity is essential. Amen? Let's pray. O oh, great and heavenly Father, blessed Son and eternal Spirit, we come to worship you, God in three persons, one in essence, perfected in every way, the one and only true God. Our hearts are filled with gratitude for the redemption of our heavenly Father. That which was furnished for us in Christ the Son and applied to us by the Holy Spirit. Undeserving though we are, you have welcomed us into your everlasting kingdom so that we might be partakers of your unspeakable glory. Again, Father, we, we thank you that in the fullness of your grace, you loved us. You sent your only Son to redeem us. Lord Jesus, though existing eternally in the form of God, you did not count that as something to be clung to. You humbled yourself. You took on the form of a servant and were made in the likeness of men. As a man, you became a, a servant, being obedient to the Father's will in every way, even unto death on the cross. That one sacrifice atoned for our sins forever and ever and provided us with a covering such as we needed, the spotless garment of your perfect righteousness. Holy Spirit, you've also loved us everlastingly and now you make us your permanent abode. You live in our hearts, letting your life and your power flow through us, producing abundant fruit and conforming us daily into the image of Christ. Oh God, one God, yet three persons, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you for your mercy, undeserved, and your grace beyond measure. We bring you our praise, our worship, our love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.